Well, it's good to be here at this uh, summer conference. As John said in his introduction, this is the cent centenary, I would say centenary, though I guess you say cent centenary, but uh, centenary is what I say coming from England, of uh, HPB's passing. Now, uh, some people have said it's a rather strange thing to be celebrating uh, that somebody's passing. Well, I guess we're not actually celebrating it in, uh, in that sense. Uh, however, it is very much a memorial event, a time to remember and a time to reflect on the person of H.P. Blavatsky, H.P.B. And that's what basically this talk is about. I want to focus on certain aspects of HPB to bring those sorts of these, these aspects into sharp focus for you and perhaps renew and to refresh uh, our thinking of this extraordinary woman. The society is in no sense uh, an HPB cult. I don't think it ever has been one. It is not the personality of HPB that we uh, remember on occasions like this, but it is, if you will, the genius of the woman, using genius in the broadest sense of the word. And it's certain aspects of that, uh, that specialness of the woman that I want to focus on this evening. We need, I believe, to try and understand the woman herself in order to understand her significance, firstly in, the, in her position within the Theosophical Movement, as the founder indeed of the modern Theosophical Movement, and uh, her place in history, because uh, the Theosophical Movement has had a considerable impact, I would say, on 20th century history. We need to understand her in terms of what she taught. Uh, now, I don't propose to give a lecture to any great extent this evening on what she did teach, but what I would ask you to do in thinking of her is to think in terms of those teachings which she spent so much of her time producing. I remember at one juncture some years ago, I went, uh, I, I went to the lengths of trying to work out just how much she had written. And as a very rough guesstimate, I came up with about four million words. Now that's probably an underestimate if it's anything. Uh, certainly in her latter years, she seemed to be doing nothing but writing, as far as one can discover. Uh, whether it was writing books like The Secret Doctrine, or whether it was writing correspondence, because she was a voluminous correspondent, as we're about to discover when the collected letters of H.P. Blavatsky are published in a, in a little while. However, why did I call this, uh, this particular talk a priestess of Isis? It is, I confess, a somewhat whimsical title, but uh, it came about as a result of a particular passage which uh, she wrote to her sister, uh, her sister Vera. And I'd like to start off by just reading you this short extract from a letter to her <coughs> sister. It was written at about the time that she was writing Isis Unveiled in, in New York, so this would have been in the 1870s sometime, I would guess, between 1873 and 1875. She says, well, Vera, whether you believe me or not, something extraordinary is happening to me. You cannot imagine in what a charmed world of pictures and visions I live. I'm writing Isis, not writing, rather copying out and drawing that which she personally shows to me. Upon my word, sometimes it seems to me that the ancient goddess of beauty in person leads me through all the countries of past centuries which I have to describe. And it was that, uh, it was that phrase, it was that, that passage which inspired this particular title, A Priestess of Isis. But it has another significance to me, and it is the key, if you will, to what I would talk about this evening. If you, would if you would read a history of uh, HPB, you have plenty to choose from. There are a number of biographies, and if you haven't, then I would strongly recommend that you do read one or several of those biographies. But it's a certain aspect of her life which I, th I would like to concentrate on this evening. 
And that aspect is her inner or occult life. Now, I suppose we use the word occult advisedly here because her inner life was indeed secret, hidden. And even now, uh, we can only get glimpses of what that inner life truly comprised. But unless we understand at least something of that inner life that uh, was HPV, I think it is difficult to interpret the historical events which surrounded her. I think if we would understand the motivation, then we must look to the inner side of the woman rather than the outer circumstances of the historical personage that we knew as Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. What I want to do then is to start by reviewing certain incidents in her life which I think are key to understanding this inner, inner life that I've referred to. I want to start off by looking at, firstly at the, her early years. Now, what is interesting to me about her early years, and to this again we are largely indebted to her sister Vera for accounts as to the sort of child that she was, at that time she was a natural psychic a natural sensitive. I don't know what quite the right word to use, but undoubtedly she had uh, contact with what we might broadly call the inner worlds. There are fascinating accounts given of uh, this period by her sister, which paint a picture of a very vivid imagination, uh, a fascinating child, a child who would uh, um, fascinate those around her, other children, and indeed adults, with her accounts of what she saw in nature, um, the spirit worlds that she saw around her. There's one account of what she would see when she just looked at objects around her. She would see faces in the carpet, faces in the curtains, and so forth. And some would be beneficent, and some would be malevolent, uh, uh, and so it would be. But she would describe all of this with total conviction. To her, this inner world was a reality. Certainly in her earlier years, she was mediumistic. Uh, certainly what in later years we would, have, we would have undoubtedly classified as a medium. She would uh, conduct what in later years would be called seances. Uh, and she would tell some of these stories even against herself to show the fallibility of that sort of mediumship. There's one rather fascinating incident which she tells uh, she was, this was largely done for her family and close friends. It was not done in any public sense. But uh, mediumistically, she claimed to be in touch with uh, somebody who was uh, a friend of the family who was supposedly dead. And she claimed to be in touch with this woman and uh, recounted the most amazing details which convinced everybody that she was indeed talking to the spirit of this dead, uh, dead friend. Even to the extent of... Uh, recounting details that only this woman could have known uh, about the location of documents, I think at that time at St. Petersburg. And everyone was absolutely fascinated by these powers until, lo and behold, the lady herself walked through the door. She wasn't dead at all. <laughs> and HBB quotes, uh, you know, quotes this incident, uh, I guess against herself, to say, just how misleading the psychic world can be. She, she then explained how the incident came about, and it was as a result of various psychic elements, including psychometry, of, you know, conversations that she'd heard, and so forth, and a vivid imagination had put together uh, this psychic entity, which she then would communicate with. So certainly mediumistic, whether of that variety or of, uh, or of the real thing. Another element uh, can be found at, uh, at, this, uh, at this early stage in her life. We know late, latterly that she contacted her, uh, her master and the occult brotherhood. What is perhaps less well known is that she was well aware of being under the protection or guidance of such a, such a master, such a teacher, from a very early age. Uh, she, would con she would see and converse with this figure not really knowing at that stage what the significance was. It's interesting that when she did finally meet her master in, in 1851, 
She recorded in her, in her scrapbook, of which more anon, that she had met the master of her dreams. Well, it wasn't, some, you know, it wasn't an extraordinary meeting with somebody that she didn't, she didn't know already. She was telling, uh, telling her scrapbook and those who would read it subsequently that this was a figure that she already knew in her inner life. There's an incident told of her at that early age. She was an intrepid child and would go, uh, would, would go riding bareback, Cossack style, as she would describe it. And uh, on one occasion, she, uh, uh, she, she was in the process of falling off and would have, uh, her head would have dashed against the, the ground underneath when she felt a hand holding and supporting her head until the horse was stopped and she could get off safely. And she says that that, if you will, was the astral hand of her protector, her master. So she, at, even at that early age, she was well aware of the presence of these masters and had these latent or developing psychic talents. I guess the real story of her inner life begins with the meeting of her master in 1851. Now, again, as with this incident, as with others, we cannot be sure exactly of what happened at any of these times. Her inner life, I think, is cloaked in mystery. And how, however much we may put together in terms of uh, insights here and there, uh, I have this strong suspicion that she protected her inner life very carefully against prying eyes and told as little as she could get away with and what she couldn't get away, what she had to tell she would tell in a way which would act if you will as disinformation not lying exactly but making sure that the real truth didn't come out the story that we normally hear of her meeting of her master was that it was in 1851 in Hyde Park and that uh, there was a visiting contingent of Indian princes and she first caught a glimpse of him in this contingent and he made a sign to her to say nothing and then he sub subsequently met with her and uh, told her of her, uh, of her subsequent development. But there's another account which is again, which illustrates this point that I was making about disinformation while she was writing The Secret Doctrine, so this would have been probably in 1886, she was joined by the Countess Wachmeister, uh, who'd, came, who'd come from, I guess, from Sweden, and uh, helped her unpack various trunks which she'd brought with her from India. And in the process of this unpacking, came across a scrapbook that HBB had been putting together for obviously for a long time. And it contained a uh, an item which related to 1851 and the meeting with her master. It, written in French, and it just said, uh, a memorable night, and it says an, a certain night in August, memorable night when I met the master of my dreams. And then it says, in Ramsgate. And uh, the countess said, well, why did you put Ramsgate? You met him in London. And she said, well, it was a blind. Well, why would you put a blind into a scrapbook which you didn't think anybody but yourself was going to read? Well, the speculation is uh, that it was a double blind, that she said that to the countess to make her think that it was London. Well, the suggestion is that maybe it was Ramsgate all along. Yeah. Uh, so you see, a, a double blind. This is all speculation, and her, her campaign of disinformation has obviously worked, because I don't know what the answer is. But the speculation, uh, it, why should it have been Ramsgate? Well, speculation which came out recently in, a, in an investigative biography of uh, Madame Blavatsky by Jean Overton Fuller was that in nearby Margate, which both are on the south coast of England, there is a fascinating cave called the Shell Cave. Uh, which is not very large, but the entire cavity of it is covered in shells. It's a natural formation. And she speculates, Jean Overton Fuller speculates, that it was an initiation place. And she speculates, so I'll pass it on to you for what it's worth, that it was a memorable night indeed, because her master took her to this sacred site, if you will, and she underwent 
an initiation process. Now, whether that's true or not, who knows? You're left to speculate for yourselves. However, undoubtedly, this, this encounter in 1851 was of enormous significance. She was told uh, this by her own account, that uh, uh, she had been selected for this work of forming the Theosophical Society. So even as early as 1851, she knew what her life's work was to be. She, again, it was offered to her, and it was, uh, she was told what the trials and tribulations would be, what the strife, what the dissension. No doubt she was uh, forewarned of many of the uh, events which later came to pass would be, but she accepted. The first of a number of what I would call sacrificial moves, we shall see more later in this account. She was also told at this stage that she would have to go to Tibet for three years for training, for occult training. And we'll come back to that point a little later as well, because it's an area around which a lot of historians have spent a lot of time speculating as to what time, if any, she spent in Tibet. That then to me is a, a, a crucial incident in her inner life and inner development. Uh, and we shall see others. For me, the next most crucial event uh, skips forward a number of years. This particular event occurred in 1863. HBB, as I'm sure most of you know, was an extensive traveler. Uh, most of her time uh, after her um, abortive marriage was spent in worldwide travel. Whether, uh, well, just about any part of the globe you care to name, she seems to have visited at one time or another. But there was one, this particular incident that I'd like to spend a little time looking at now uh, was, took place in Russia. She had been visiting a military settlement um, at a place with the unlikely sounding name, if I can pronounce it correctly, of Ozur Getty, and um, uh, took ill. Uh, now, nobody at the time knew what, what really the trouble was. She seemed to have some sort of wasting disease, and she was just getting thinner and thinner, and seemed appeared to be wasting away. So they decided that the best thing they could think to do was to send her home. Well, home at that time was in a place called Tiflis, and between the two places, transport wasn't too wonderful. Uh, I guess transport in Russia at the time wasn't too wonderful between any two places. <laughs> there certainly weren't any freeways, there certainly weren't any cars. Uh, the means of transport that they came by was to put her on a barge and send her up a canal. Well. Uh, this process took apparently two or three weeks for, for her to get to where she was going to. And during this journey, a number of very extraordinary incidents occurred. She was accompanied mostly just by some boat, boat people, boatmen and a personal servant. Well, the boatmen were terrified because uh, uh, they would see apparitions of HPB floating across the water and being superstitious and so forth, they were absolutely terrified and deserted her. So she was left pretty much uh, to her own devices, plus that of the, uh, of the servant. Um, she would eat virtually nothing during this journey and continued apparently just to waste away. She does, however, give an interesting account of what was actually taking place at this time. Uh, she, she uses the phrase, I lived a double life. And by this, she means that she was in two states of consciousness. If somebody close by would talk to her, she would answer quite rationally. Uh, she knew what was being said to her and so forth. But she said it interrupted another life that she was leading in quite another place and in, uh, in quite another state. And she said as soon as the conversation in, in real time, if you will, finished, she would revert to uh, where she was, uh, where she was in this inner dream life or dream world. Now, this point she would she would say afterwards. This crucial uh, process afterwards marked a dividing line in her life. She said, 
between the HPB before 1863 and the HPB after 1863, she says there is an impassable gulf, as if almost it's two different people that we're talking about. The other crucial thing which, uh, which transpired as a result of this illness and so forth is that the involuntary mediumistic psychic capacities that she had been born with came entirely under her control. From that time onwards, she said, she was no longer bothered by extraneous psychic events. She knew exactly what she was doing, and she could control entirely uh, the pro psychic processes that were going on in and around her. She was in control. Some, somebody has uh, characterized the switch as between a medium and a mediator. Now, whether that's meaningful to you or not, I don't know, but it's in intended to indicate that the medium is the passive the one who is subject to psychic influences, whereas the mediator is active, in control, and is the initiator of these events and processes as they occur. I believe it is at this point that the inner ego in HPB awoke to its real life and function. Now, it's at this point that I think we need to look at the teachings that she, mm, that she came out with, that she propounded, because it is in, it's vital at this stage that we understand what she means by the inner ego, which uh, I think awoke at this point and became such a, such a crucial divider, dividing line in her life. Well, the, the teachings that I refer to can be found I guess, throughout her writings. Certainly it can be found in the Key to Theosophy, which was published in 1889. Uh, it pervades much of her esoteric instructions and so forth. Uh, many of her later articles published in Lucifer, now available through the collected writings, deal with this duality of the ego within us. Now, let me just, if you'll bear with me, I'll just spend a minute or two talking about this. We all know, I guess, of the sevenfold constitution of man, though we may differ in terms of terminology as to what, what that constitutes. Now, depending on your, uh, your view of this, we can regard these seven principles as so many aspects which make up the whole person, the real, the real person. But within that, there are, according to what HPB wrote and taught, two, if you will, quite distinct centers of conscious, consciousness and conscious action. We can talk first of all of the lower ego, the personality, which we're all daily familiar with, and we can talk about the combination of principles which go up, go to make up the personality. But uh, part of that certainly has to be what we would call the lower or concrete mind, which is what we use uh, the whole time for our normal mental functions. But this, she taught, was derived from a higher or inner ego. Um, and this, both the secret doctrine and in other places spends a lot of time talking about the origins of this higher or inner ego. She draws a very sharp distinction between the lower or personal ego and the higher or inner ego. It is not a question of a difference of degree between the one and the other. It is a difference in kind. It is not a question that by purification of the lower ego, by meditative practices, by austerities and so forth, that in any way the lower ego will somehow, in some way, transform itself into the higher ego, but, you know, a chrysalis into butterfly or something like that. It seems, from the way she taught it, that these two centers of consciousness are quite distinct and must remain so. Yes, the mind is one, there is but one mental principle within us, and yes, ultimately, causally, there is but one ego. But in terms of functionally, of the way it operates, there are two distinct centers of consciousness, and they will always be so. This teaching is confirmed in uh, one of the crucial Mahatma letters, where they talk about the nature of what constitutes an adept. 
they use there the term the inner man and the outer man. I'm sorry about the sexist language, but uh, that's the way the Mahatmas wrote. Uh, weren't familiar with the late 20th century usage of the language. And they talked of the way in which one gained access to the inner man, who they identified with the adept in that, partic in that particular letter. And they talk of the outer man having to be paralyzed, either totally or partially, in order to liberate the inner ego. So two quite, dis even for an adept, two quite distinct functional groupings of principles, two quite distinct centers of consciousness. Interesting that they should identify the inner with the, with the adept. The adept is uh, entirely known by and entirely identified by the functions of the inner man, the inner ego. Uh, we, uh, now the crucial thing is how do, how do we get the inner, inner ego into full function? Well, HBB taught uh, in a crucial article entitled Dreams which was published as part of the transactions of the Blavatsky Lodge originally. Now it's available in volume 10 of the collected writings. That that inner ego lives its life during your sleep. So when the personal ego sleeps, the inner ego, the real person, wakes and lives its life in a completely different world. So during incarnation, if you will, we alternate between these two states of being and consciousness. That of the, the consciousness of the lower ego, and that, during special times, the liberated inner ego, which functions, as I say, in this way during sleep. Not, not always, obviously, not every time you go to sleep, because the quality of sleep will differ. Uh, a drugged sleep, I don't think, counts. But... Uh, uh, an, there are times when the inner ego is thus liberated and uh, its, its nature, its powers, its consciousness are quite, quite different from that of what we know as the personal ego. Now, I believe this event that I've just referred to, this crucial illness that Madame Blavatsky underwent, liberated within her that inner ego so that she gained access to that level of being and consciousness at will not involuntarily when she slept only, and could learn uh, and begin to function from that level. There's a crucial passage which, uh, look as I might, I can no longer find in the literature, where she refers to this point as the point at which her master bid her soul to soar. Uh, she woke up. It's like that, uh, it's like that phrase which uh, uh, who was it? I think it's Arthur Kessler who, who, who referred to us as sleepwalkers. And yes, this to us is normal waking life, but supposing you are but sleeping during this phase of your life and your real life is the waking state of your inner ego. Well, if it's true of one, it's true of all. And that, I believe, is our, is our destiny. But I believe, crucially, that was the point that Madame Blavatsky, if you will, in this incarnation, learned to access that level of being and the, the, the functions and the, uh, the powers which lie latent at that level of within our being. I'd like to move on from that to look at what I regard as the next, probably the most crucial part of her inner life and inner development. And that is the period that she spent in Tibet uh, undergoing her inner development or training. As I say, I referred, it was referred to in 1851 by her master Moria, who told her that she would have to go through this training. And her account there says three years. Now, uh, theosophical folklore says that she spent seven years in Tibet. Well. There is uh, no indication that I can find that she indeed spent seven years in, in the sense that we would mean it, uh, undergoing that sort of training. Three years I could believe. Uh, the candidates that I have for those three years would be 1865 to 1867. Uh, various biographers uh, look at this differently. Um, 
Uh, one I read just vaguely for the period said, traveling in Asia. Well, traveling in Asia for three years could mean anything, couldn't it? Uh, the, this 1865 to 67 um, I owe to Geoffrey Barbauker, and it seems reasonable to me. Um, whether it's true is another matter, but it, it's a reasonable speculation. What happened during this training? Well, again, we don't really know, and can we be expected to know? Would it mean anything to you if you were told? Uh, I guess it's really only the, uh, the pupil who undergoes the training who would understand the terms of the training. To be told uh, what the training re uh, undergone by a nuclear physicist, for instance, if you're not a nuclear physicist, doesn't really mean much to you, does it? So it's enough, I think, to know that she underwent training. We get the odd glimpse from correspondence and so forth as to, as to what actually happened. Uh, one, uh, to me, interesting sidelight which comes out of this is that she learned English from one of, the one of the masters at that particular point. She had learned English very early on in her childhood from a Yorkshire nurse. And she apparently said that she spoke, uh, she spoke English with a thick Yorkshire accent at that early stage. But by the time she'd come to do her work as an adult, she'd completely forgotten anything in English. She spoke, of course, Russian and French, which was the court language uh, of, for, for Russian noble people at the time. She also spoke another, uh, a number of other European languages, including Italian. But at that time, no English. Now, seeing as uh, she had been earmarked for this work uh, in forming the Theosophical Society, clearly she was going to have to know English if she were to work in the English-speaking people. Where did she learn it from? Well, apparently she learned it from Kut Humi. Well, again, Theosophical tradition has it that Kut Humi spent uh, some time <coughs> in Europe and had a university education. Now, uh, I say Theosophical tradition has it because uh, uh, I regard a lot of this as fairly speculative. Uh, it's based on a few stray comments in a few stray Mahatma letters rather than anything else. Nonetheless, uh, as, as is evidenced in the Mahatma letters, he speaks obviously good and fluent English. She, learned, she apparently learned it from him. Now this came out uh, uh, in a letter that she wrote to Sinnott at the time that the, uh, the Hodgson report came out. And they were trying to work out whether uh, Madame Blavatsky had written the Mahatma letters. And they said, well, there's a, there's a great similarity in style between her usage of England, English and those of the Mahatmas in the Mahatma letters. And she writes to Sinnott, it's not surprising, because I learned my English from that Mahatma. Uh, you would expect uh, a similarity, would you not, if you were using the same style as your teacher. But I don't suppose that would actually cut a lot of ice with psychic investigators. But it's an interesting insight in the, in the fact that uh, that's part of the training that she went through. Uh, other little glimpses, for instance, when she came to write The Voice of the Silence, uh, she, she says that the three fragments in The Voice of the Silence were uh, three among a number, I forget the number that she says, that she actually had had to memorize during her training. Uh, some 30 or 40 other odd fragments, as I recall, which she had actually memorized there. Uh, so we get insights, we just get little glimpses as to what, what went on there, but uh, not much. We can but judge by her subsequent life what, psychic, uh, what inner faculties, what occult powers she had thus developed, and um, presumably they would have been developed at that particular time. Now, concerning this training, we get another insight into it much later. By, the, by this time, we're talking about uh, the early 1880s, by which time the famous uh, correspondence between the Mahatmas and Sinnott and Hume had begun. And uh, much as Sinnott and Hume, or Sinnott in particular, 
uh, was fascinated by uh, HPB. He obviously found her a difficult person to work with. Uh, she had a temper which would uh, fly off the handle at, at, a given, at any given instance. Uh, a nervous temperament, uh, very much on edge and so forth. And he writes, obviously we don't have his side of the correspondent, but you can infer from the correspondence that he'd written to the Mahatma saying, why is she as odd as she is? And the Mahatma writes back a crucial letter in the series, number 26, for those of you who wish to read it, uh, wherein he starts off, I, I'm painfully aware of her habitual incoherence and so forth and her undesirability as an agent for, communi for our communication. And he says, this is all on account of her occult training in Tibet. And then goes on to uh, offer a partial explanation as to what had actually happened. Now he says in this particular letter that she is as odd as she is because after this occult training, uh, something of her had to remain in Tibet to act firstly as a medium of communication between the one and the other, the wire of transmission, I think they say in the letter, and secondly, and probably more crucially, that as a uh, to make sure that secrets which must not be told would not be told by her by under any circumstance or any pressure. So those two crucial factors uh, underlay this, uh, this strange uh, process. Now, what was it that was left behind? Well, who knows? Again, we're left but to speculate. The phrase that is actually used in the Mahatma letters is that one of her seven satellites had to remain behind in Tibet for, for this purpose. But nobody ever goes on to explain what on earth they meant by one of her seven satellites. Did you know you've got seven satellites? Well, neither did I. Well, the other correspondent, um, Alan Octavian Hume, obviously thought they were referring to her seven principles. And in a letter to HPB, he writes very sarcastically, uh, analyzing the sevenfold constitution as they knew it at the time, saying, well, it obviously isn't the physical body, because there it is, and works his way through the other, the other six principles, saying, well, it, you know, it obviously can't be this, so tell us, old chaps, which principle is it that you've kept? Um, <laughs> and uh, there's a little footnote written by the Mahatma which says, very clever. Uh, <laughs> but, but supposing it wasn't any one principle, but a bit of each. Uh, and that ob obviously is uh, a little further down the track of trying to understand what it is. But they do go on to say that as a result of this, there is an inner weakness in, the, in every person who undergoes training and, uh, for, for whom this happens. And they imply that, the, mm, that hereditary now has uh, an influence. So her temper, I, the implication is that her temper was hereditary rather than uh, her own, which would normally have been kept in control were the whole person there to control it. But without the f whole person there, these hereditary weaknesses came to the fore. Well, there it is. That's, uh, that's the way uh, it's explained. It's a fascinating letter, that. Uh, which repays a good deal of study. It's in that letter, for instance, that they say that uh, uh, the chiefs had searched for nearly a century to find a European body, not very, not very uh, appealing, is it? A European body that they could send out on European soul, uh, soil to act as a, communing, commu uh, as a link between themselves and the Western world knowing full well that this uh, centennial effort to uh, awaken uh, the Western world were, was due to occur, they were looking for a messenger. And they, they go on to say, though she was, not the, the, she was not the best, she was the best available. And again, uh, it, you wonder, don't you, as to, uh, as to what, uh, what lies behind the, the, those sorts of phrases, as to... <coughs> Uh, who else seemingly better qualified had obviously been passed up. What made her suitable at all? 
again, we're left to our own devices to speculate as to what it was. But I would contend that it's a lot of the sorts of things which we've, uh, I've outlined already, the inner development, the innate faculty and, ca and capability which was there, which could be awakened, which made her a suitable, uh, a suitable envoy, if you will, for the work that had to be done. I'd like to turn now to uh, consideration of uh, the sorts of occult faculties, occult powers, if you will, that she displayed certainly in later life, which again give us clues and insights into the inner development of the person in question. Certainly, uh, and probably most trivially, were the various occult phenomena that she was capable of and did produce. We become, uh, we, we see signs of this in her work with Olcott in New York when she was writing Ice Sun Unveiled, but it becomes much more publicly documented uh, in, uh, in, when she moves to India. And uh, if, you would, uh, if you would read The Occult World by A.P. Sinnott, you will find there, of course, a detailed account of all the various occult phenomena that she produced for him, rather in the way that you would give candy to a child, I suspect, you know, to, uh, you know, to keep, him, can be, keep him interested, uh, but rapidly he had to be weaned off, if you will, uh, psychic phenomena at a later stage. But nonetheless, uh, although uh, it's not just a question of us sitting back and going, wow, it, it's interesting to see the sorts, of, uh, the sorts of phenomena that she was indeed capable of producing. Well, initially it was things like ringing astral bells and taps on tables and these sorts of things, which uh, no doubt to Sinnott, who was after all a spiritualist by, at heart, were absolutely fascinating. But when you think of the later phenomena that she would produce for him, uh, the producing of Mahatma letters, after all it was she who uh, uh, through whom the bulk of those letters came, though there were indeed many other recipients, uh, transmitters of those letters, that, uh, that we see some of the occult powers involved. I'll come back to that uh, in just a little while. She would produce physical objects too. Uh, there is a, uh, a famous uh, instance uh, wherein uh, while they were in Simla, on a picnic, uh, they produced for them a cup and saucer uh, for the tea party. They, they, they were out on a picnic. Funny places they go for picnics. They, they were not like our picnics, I should hasten to add. And they took everything with them, practically including the kitchen sink, as far as you can make out on these picnics. And certainly bone china, you know, and all uh, cups and saucers. But a stray guest turned up, so. Uh, uh, they suggested that uh, they produce a, another cup and saucer for this additional guest. Well, they did do, and it was found buried under the roots of some trees in a very inaccessible spot, and the cup and saucer is, to this day, to be found in Adyar, so uh, a real enough cup and saucer. Now, for the most part, the account reads as if it was the Mahatmas that did this, but a later, uh, much later on, in the Mahatma letters, they write to Sinnott and say, I suppose you realize that two-thirds of the power required to produce a lot of those phenomena in the early days was provided by her. We had no right to stop her. And although it was killing her doing it, uh, she, you know, she gladly would do this, uh, zealous, you might say, zealous to a fault, but nonetheless, undoubtedly, she had the cap capabilities to do and to produce these sorts of phenomena. She would, uh, she would produce portraits. She, she did indeed produce portraits of, uh, of the Mahatmas for Sinnott at the time. And they say that her artistic ability far outstrips anything that their, some of the higher and initiated chalers could possibly have done. And again, these would be been psychically produced. Undoubtedly, the, uh, the, uh, the writing that she did, whether of Mahatma letters or otherwise, demonstrated her uh, occult powers in quite an extraordinary way. 
Certainly the, uh, the letters which were produced, the early <coughs> Mahatma letters which were produced by precipitation, as it's become known, uh, would have required her active cooperation. Uh, there's a, there is a particular Mahatma letter where they attempt to explain the process, though again, seeing as we don't have, uh, uh, we don't understand a lot of the processes, I, whether their attempt actually helps or not is another matter. Interestingly, they're talking of this process of precipitation wherein the writing just appears, so to speak, in the paper. Uh, they say when scientists will have understood how it is that Im impresses of leaves come to be left on stones, we should be better able to explain to you how this process of precipitation works. Uh, they say, we do but servilely copy nature in all her processes. So, you know, they're doing nothing extraordinary that nature itself, herself, couldn't already do. But the actual process of precipitation requires the active cooperation of a chela, a pupil, uh, to pr produce it. Um, they liken the process to a printing press, and they say that the, the ink, so to speak, comes from the akasha, but the, the nervous organization of the chela becomes the printing press. Uh, I don't know that she would have liked to have thought of herself as a printing press, but uh, that's how they describe it. Some was done by dictation fairly clearly. Uh, so again, she would hear whatever it is that she was uh, supposed to write and then would physically write it. But again, it, it speaks of the ability to hear at a distance, clever, clever audience of a, of a high degree. Another uh, obvious faculty that she had, which comes out as a result of her writings, is reading in the astral light. Now, the astral light, uh, the lower analog of the universal akasha, uh, contains a record of uh, all that has been and foreshadows all that will be. She had obviously the ability to use the astral light as, uh, as her own personal library. Uh, you get fascinating accounts of this written by uh, Olcott in probably the first volume, I think, I should think, of his series, Old Diary Leaves, certainly while that they were writing Isis Unveiled. Uh, this, uh, he, would, he, would, he, he would describe the way she would uh, write. He would, she would be writing something, and then she would look up with rather unfocused eyes as if she were looking out there somewhere, and we'd be copying something down, looking look up, copy something down. Look up. And he said, wherever I looked, there was nothing, you know. And uh, it was in the astral light that she saw it. There's another rather fascinating account that he gives. Apparently, he was the proofreader for this. And he, he read through one of these quotations, which had obviously come in this sort of way. And he read it through, and he said it was obviously wrong. You know, it had obviously been miscopied. And he said to her, look, you've got it wrong. And she said, no, 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 trust me, it's right. He, he, he wasn't to be browbeaten by this. And he said, no, no, look, it, it's obvious nonsense. And she said, well, wait a minute. And five minutes later, she, she pointed over to the side of the room and said, you see that book over there? Check the reference in that book. And he looked over there, and he, he says, there certainly was no book over there five minutes earlier. Well, he gets up, and he gets this book. And lo and behold, it's the book he needs in order to check this reference. Uh, and it's a fairly archaic, you know, fairly archaic book, and he, he checks it, and lo and behold, she has got it wrong. So he, copy, he copies out the correct quotation from the book, and she says, well, just put the book back over there, will you please? So he puts it back over there and gets on with his work. He looks up five minutes later, and the book is gone. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the way to uh, do your research work, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> So, very, very fascinating uh, instances of these occult powers that she had clearly developed in this sort of way. A third and uh, probably last for this evening uh, instance of these occult powers is, uh, I, I think, a particularly fascinating one. It's one that Jeffrey Baum Borker comments on extensively in a book called HPB, Tibet and Tulku. And those of you who are interested in the subject will be well advised to read that book. 
Uh, he refers to this, uh, this Tibetan term, tulku, and suggests that this is something which applies to HPB. Now, the term tulku, uh, as used in, in Tibet, is one which describes the process whereby, for instance, Dalai Lamas are supposed to incarnate, uh, but it's supposed to apply to other high Lamas as well. When they die, they take on, uh, without the normal dismemberment of principles, without the normal subsequent after-death states that we would expect, they uh, re-embody, if you will, rather than reincarnate, shall we say, re-embody almost immediately in a new child, in a young child. And uh, there are various processes whereby such a new incarnation can be recognized because they will uh, show familiarity with objects that they're supposed to have known previously. Well, the Dalai Lama is indeed supposed to be one such. Uh, the Teshu or Tashai Lama is also supposed to be uh, identified. The subsequent reincarnations are supposed to be identified in this way. That classically then is the process of tulku. Now, the process actually involved here, whether it happens after the death of the previous incarnation or whether it happens during the life of, is nonetheless a process which can be, uh, can be described. It seems that it's possible for a high, one highly developed individual to so overshadow another as to effectively take control of their physical body. Now, Barbocker in his book actually says, um, if, if the truth be known, this process is not actually tulku. It's another, and he uses another word called avesha. And he says, technically, if you want to be right, it's avesha that we're talking about here. But he says, nobody's ever heard of avesha. So we'll continue to call it tulku. Uh, but nonetheless, he says this process was undoubtedly used with HPB. Uh, we get, we get accounts of this process from both sides. We get a pro accounts of it objectively from Olcott, for instance, when uh, Isis Unveiled was being written. He said he would be gaily having a conversation with her while she was writing, and he would look up at her, and there was somebody completely different looking out through the familiar face and the eyes. And he said, you know, sometimes he was in complete awe of whoever it was that was now in control of the body that he knew as HPB. Uh, odd little things, he said, you know, physical mannerisms would carry over. There was one who would come who obviously had a moustache, because he'd be twiddling with his mis a non-existent moustache, you see. And, uh, because HPB presumably didn't have a moustache. <laughs> <laughs> but we also get subjective accounts from her, but from HPB. She says that, you know, from her point of view, uh, if she knew that this process was about to occur, she would willingly relinquish control of her physical body while this process was taking place. And she said it was like being moved to one side. And she was fully aware of what was being said or done through her physical body. She was totally conscious of the whole thing throughout, but she had voluntary, voluntarily and consciously given over control of a physical body to some other in, uh, entity who would then write or speak through her. Now, uh, in the form as described, I believe that this could only be done as a result of the occult training that she, that she had gone through. Now, were you to describe this process to most people interested in this, uh, in this sort of thing, they would say, oh, yeah, well, she was a channel, wasn't she? It was channeling. Which just goes to show you how misleading a single word, channeling, can be. Um, of course, there wasn't any such word in, uh, used for that in uh, 200 years ago. Channeling is a fairly recent invention, is it not? But uh, undoubtedly, um, what went on here was that form of inspiration, the, uh, the working of another entity, another incarnate or perhaps even discarnate for all I know being, who would have worked in and through her physical body. 
Uh, it differs, I, I suggest, from what is normally called channeling in the sense that she was fully in control of the process and knew exactly what was happening and consciously chose to allow this process to occur. And I believe that that requires a good deal more control, conscious control of one's inner vehicles than uh, you might otherwise expect. So these then uh, are some instances of the occult powers that she was plainly capable of demonstrating. And those I attribute entirely to the occult training that she underwent in, in, in Tibet. But it could only have been so because she was born innately with uh, an, a sensitive psychic nature in the first place. As a footnote uh, to all of this, uh, I would draw your attention to the fact that the, uh, one, of the, the, one of the principal founders of the society, Madame Levatsky, was indeed uh, so intimately concerned with, caught up in what we would now call the psychic world. For a lot of the time, uh, we have tended to cry off the psychic world and say, oh, no, no, we won't have anything to do with the psychic world, nasty, nasty deceptive stuff, the psychic world, uh, perhaps taking, uh, taking note of uh, things that she said in the voice of the silence about how under every flower there's a serpent coiled and so forth, and we think, well, we won't have anything to do with the nasty psychic world in that way. But our, one of our principal founders demonstrated intimate familiarity with that psychic world and indeed could control it. Uh, I think we uh, shun it, the psychic world, uh, to our detriment. I'm not inviting you all suddenly to rush off and start developing psychic powers, but I am suggesting that we look more closely at this whole area and not dismiss it uh, too quickly. Um, Joy Mills is f frequently fond of saying, uh, you can't go beyond the mind until you've got a mind, uh, which is a good phrase, and I like it. I would suggest to you that you can't go beyond the psychic world until you've experienced it. Yes, it may be very deceptive, but how are you going to find that out short of actually being deceived by it a few times? <laughs> and then you will know at first hand that it's deceptive. So uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from it. Um, I'm reminded of... Uh, uh, a phrase, I believe, of Emerson, though I'm sure the, uh, the literati amongst you will correct me if I'm wrong, who said uh, of, of, of somebody, what you are speaks so loudly, I cannot hear what you say. Well, I'd suggest we apply that to HPB. What you are indeed speaks so loudly. She was of the psychic world. The psychic powers that we've talked about, the psychic and inner development that I've talked about, uh, invites us. To, to look at and to investigate that aspect of her life and story. I think it's a very important aspect and not to be uh, downplayed or underplayed. To conclude, I'd like just to look momentarily at uh, the sacrifices to which this woman uh, very voluntarily underwent, uh, that she underwent. She knew full well from 1851 uh, what her life would be like if she chose to work for the master uh, in cooperation with him in ultimately founding the Theosophical Society. She says that she knew what the trials and tribulations would be. And boy, did she go through it. Uh, and I guess most of you will know the ins and outs of that. But I'm reminded particularly of an incident which occurred while she was writing The Secret Doctrine. Uh, she seemed to go through a, a number of crucial illnesses in her life. Well, she went through another one in 18, 1886 while she was writing The Secret Doctrine. And the, the doctors uh, had virtually given her up for dead. And indeed, the Countess Wachmeister, who was her <laughs> constant companion at the time, uh, says that uh, you know, she had kept a, a vigil uh, fearing that she would die in the night and had, in fact had dozed off and woke up with a start in the morning uh, 
you know, very guiltily, thinking that she'd failed in her vigil and that she would find HPB a corpse. Well, in fact, nothing of the sort. I mean, HPB was looking actually quite perky, and it obviously uh, it was a lot better than she was the night before. And uh, HPB said, yes, the masters have been here, and they've fixed me again. <laughs> and uh, uh, they said I was offered the, the chance of dying there and then, because she was that ill, or of being given time enough to finish my secret doctrine. And she, you know, she goes on to say, and I am to go to London, and I'm to form a group there. And uh, I think it foreshadowed all the, uh, the esoteric section work that she did. And they talked to me, they explained to me all the trials and tribulations that will come with that. And uh, she said, well, I've, I've accepted that. And she said, and now to make my sacrifice complete, make me a cup of coffee and pass me my tobacco pouch. 